Hello everybody, it's my pleasure to be here to present on the Finnish Trust Network. So my name is Keith Huber and I work for UbiSecure. I'm in charge of our sales engineering team there. And UbiSecure is an acquired achiever in Finland. and We power a lot of the digital services, both for government and, and large business uh, in Finland. I also represent the company in the Kantara Initiative. I'm the vice chair of the e-government working group of Kantara. And Kantara is a cross-industry association, a non-profit association, where people from different countries can get together and discuss digitalization, discuss identity, and discuss privacy. So I'm, I'm very active in those groups. And you can find me on Twitter from that Twitter handle. First, a few words about uh, UbiSecure. So UbiSecure was founded in 2002, and we're based in Espo here, here in Finland. I bet all of you have used our software at many times of your life, and most of you probably monthly, if not daily. Uh, our software powers many of the leading, leading services, many top brand name services in Finland, and we're slowly spreading outside of Scandinavia uh, to other areas within Europe. Our software is about external user management, about how to delegate access rights to large user groups, and often the people who were using APIs need to get access to APIs either directly or indirectly. So they empower somebody else to access an API using their access rights. And that's what we specialize in. I'm not from Finland. I'm originally from Australia. And when I came to Finland, I very quickly realized that Finland is a very digital society. And it's really a world-leading digital society. I moved to Finland in the year 2000, and I moved to a small town near the Russian border called Lappanranta. And that's where I spent the first two years of my life in Finland. And I very quickly got used to doing things differently to my home country of Australia. It was very common that things are done digitally, done online, done with as few words as possible. One, I want to give two very simple examples of, of how digital society has affected my life in Finland. The first one was when become a, I became a Finnish citizen. So to become a Finnish citizen, I need to complete, first I need to live and pay taxes in Finland for a long time. I need to complete language tests. I need to make sure I don't break any rules or commit any crimes. But then the next process uh, is, is quite easy. I fill out a form online. I make some attachments, and then I wait in a queue. When Migri, when they process my uh, uh, application, year 2008, it take, took many months then, it took, takes even longer now, then I got to my electronic mailbox, my net posti mailbox, I got a little email from, from Migri to say, uh, according to legislation number XYZ, you are now a Finnish citizen. Not a fancy certificate, not welcome, just a very one line, you are now a Finnish citizen. And what was great, then I was traveling abroad, I was uh, on, on holiday, I accessed my, my, my electronic email, and I got that information, I was very impressed. My brother, who's American, and we moved to, moved to Australia before I was born, my family, when he became an Australian citizen, he was in a room like this, with friends and family, flags waving, sunny day. He was invited to the stage by the local mayor, given a frame certificate, given a little tree, and, and welcome, to the, welcome to the country. In Finland, we work a little differently, a little more digitally, and a little more streamlined. But uh, that works very well. The second time when the Finnish Digital Society impacted my life for, for a benefit, was about five years ago when I was in St. Petersburg with my girlfriend. I got down on my knee and I asked her to become my wife. She said yes. That was what I thought was going to be the hardest thing to do. But actually the hardest thing is getting ready for the wedding. And we quickly realized we need to do something called estetumus turistus. This is to make sure that we're actually allowed to get married that we're both not already married, that we're not brothers and sisters. 
and other, other checks that the government does to make sure we have a, a permission to have a legal marriage. Luckily, in Finland, this process is completely automated. I was sitting on my couch, I logged into the, the portal, I put in the email address of my wife-to-be, uh, I was strongly authenticated, she got an, a message saying, Keith Huber would like to commence this process. She logged in, she said, yes, I, I agreed to that process, and after a, a very short time we got, again, a digital letter saying that the, the process has been completed and we're allowed to get married. The wedding day was on Johannes the following year, and we were in a beautiful old church, and the, the wedding ceremony went very well, and we were happily walking to the uh, reception center, and I, I, I wondered, we didn't sign anything. We didn't get a certificate. And I asked the priest, I said, oh, you, you forgot to, we forgot to sign the register. You, we didn't give us a marriage certificate. He said, no, no. I informed the population registry online, it's done. We don't get a marriage certificate. We have to, if we want that, we have to request that later. So even the most sacred ceremonies in Finland are completely digitalized and automated. To do that, to make those processes streamlined and fast and, and digital, you need to have strong authentication. You need to know who the people are in the transaction that I am me, my wife is her, the priest is authorized by the church to do his job. And strong authentication is the secret to the Finnish digital society. It's the secret to the success of Finnish digital society. And to be honest, I think strong authentication in Finland is one of the most, the, the biggest success stories for API economy. And uh, you'll see why. You might have logged in to services and seen these type of menus. In Finland, when you log into a service, you're often presented with a way to log in using either your bank, using your digital ID card, or using Mobili Varmane, which is a mobile ID inside the SIM card of your telephone. And these services are typical ways to create an account, or to confirm transactions, or to uh, attest that you are who you say you are. And this is an API which went live in already 2002. It's an API which was created by an association of banks, a very simple API, but one which empowers this digital society. Most importantly, this API has a business case. And the business case behind it is the services that are connected to this, they pay the banks for that strong identity. They don't want to have to have a queue of people coming into, into their, their point of sale uh, to show ID documents. They pay the banks for that privilege. So there's money, money being transferred in this process. And there's many good use cases for using strong identity in modern applications. The first one is for account registration, making sure that people have one and only one account, that they, you know who they are. Login is a, is a typical one. If you really want to know who the person is, or the law requires that you have a strongly identified user. Password reset is also common. People not only forget their passwords, but they forget their usernames. They even forget their email addresses. But if you've recorded their, uh, their personal number, personal ID number at the time of registration, it's very easy to reset their password using uh, strong authentication. In other cases, such as uh, self-service delegation, allowing somebody else to do something on your behalf, or satisfying other legal requirements, such as anti-money laundering or know your customer legislation, uh, strong authentication is also needed. In recent years, the GDPR has come front as a, a legal requirement to allow users to access their own data, to be able to pause processing for their data, or to be able to ask that their data is deleted and their account is uh, removed immediately. To do that, you need to identify who's asking and that are they really the owners of that data? Are you allowed to send your data to them? Other use cases for strong identification include step-up authentication, which means you first log in very weakly using, for example, a username and password, 
and then you authenticate strongly when you want to make a transaction that can't be reversed. Like one of our customers uses this before you sell the trees that are planted in your, uh, in your, in your forest. When, once you cut down a tree, you can't put it back. And the last one is attribute exchange. So the banks, mobile network operators, and the government act as uh, attribute sources to give services uh, up-to-date, accurate, and um, uh, important attributes. Simple things such as first name, last name, identity number, uh, but uh, many other attributes are available. So how have we been doing that until now? I, I said that in 2002, the TUPAS uh, protocol was formed by the Association of Banks, which is now called uh, Finance Finland in English, Finansiella RU. And that protocol is very simple. It's a, it's a form post and a, and a get response um, based on technologies from, from 2002 using signed messages. And um, if a service wants to connect all of their strong identification sources in Finland, they need to then use two other protocols, one for mobile ID and one for the HST card, for their EID card. So a service provider has to actually juggle three different types of uh, uh, protocols. But Tupas is really simple to implement. It's really simple to understand. It's well understood by the user community. Um, it does one thing and does it well. So it's very tightly tied to identifying a user or identifying a user and their company and doesn't do anything else. It doesn't try to do anything else. If you like, it's a microservice. It's decentralized, it doesn't require central management, it doesn't require central servers, and it's a, uh, completely made by rules, and it's widely adopted. But it has problems. Being made so long ago, it doesn't meet modern, modern requirements. To integrate to all of those different banks, uh, EID card and Mobile Varmane, you need to make many different uh, technical integrations and many different contracts with each of those parties. It doesn't meet modern um, uh, encryption techniques. It uses uh, shared secrets for uh, signing of data. And in fact, it will become illegal to use after the 1st of October this year. So any services which are using TUPAS right now, they should be planning how to move away from this technology. This technology uh, will be made uh, illegal. The Finnish Association of Banks, Finance, Finance Finland, uh, has decided not to develop TUPAS further, and instead in that place we'll see a new system called the Finnish Trust Network. So the Finnish Trust Network is a new uh, framework of legislation, rules and regulations made by the Finnish government together with industry, together with, uh, with the, the banking sector, with the uh, mobile, mobile operators and uh, technology providers such as UbiSecure. And they want to break the system up into two distinct roles. There will be issuers of identity uh, methods and then brokers that you can connect to who will make the connections to the various um, identity device services. And the initiative here is to try to make using strong authentication as easy as possible and more cost effective. Not only in the current system do the banks uh, are able to charge whatever the customer is willing to pay in a market environment. Um, the actual process of onboarding nine or 11 different uh, authentication providers is a very long process, requires uh, signing of legal documents, requires payment of monthly fees, and communication with many different parties. And uh, the Finnish Trust Network will remove a lot of those barriers. To visualize that, uh, this is the normal system where you have citizens who may have one or more uh, bank account at different services, uh, in, in the, uh, the yellow being, being banks in the TUPA system, and the services that they try and connect to typically connect to all of the banks. Some only connect to the major banks, but the most connect to all the banks. In the Finnish trust network, it'll be divided so that a service will typically connect to one broker on the right-hand side, which will then connect to all or as many as possible of the identity providers so that when the user connects, 
they only have to go uh, through, a, through a similar process, but the service only makes one connection. A service may choose to connect to one or more brokers. They might choose to have a backup broker. And it's a kind of a free market environment where the services, although they're offering very similar um, output, very similar attributes, they will be able to compete on things like ease of use, speed, um, usability, and the technology that they use for authenticating users. And of course, price. Powering this digital society is, for the Finnish government, an enormous expense. Every time that we log in, for example, to, to pay our tax, or we log in to check uh, our healthcare system, uh, the government is paying a small amount of money to the uh, identity providers. And this system will, will bring that cost down. So the motivations also behind this are major changes across legislation for Europe, uh, especially EIDAS regulation, which is around EID and trust services across Europe, which will help increase mobility so that foreign, uh, foreign citizens who are using uh, Finnish services will be able to log in using their, uh, their foreign identity uh, credentials. A regulation called uh, Regulation 72, which defines uh, encryption and uh, data protection rules for, for Finnish services. PSD2, which is the big change in the banking sector around uh, payment service providers, and GDPR around data protection. For example, the current uh, TUPAS implementation sends, in many cases, your uh, personal number, your social security number, in plain text. Currently. And the whole idea is to reduce cost of procurement and to improve competition, bring new services to the market, create a healthy, healthy digital society. So how will that affect you and I? How will it affect the end users? And the, the answer is very little. In fact, you can see some of the service already live today and they don't look very different to how they did in the past. You may see some services telling you that they actually outsourced their authentication to a third party, or a service may choose to redirect the user completely to a third party and let that, that party's brand be visible. So there will be different, different brokers showing a familiar set of logos and banks and operators uh, in, in different styles on different services. So for the end users, not real much change. But technically, there is a, a large amount of change. The underlying protocols for all of those authentication methods will be standardized into two main protocols. SAML2 protocol, which is based on XML, and OpenID Connect, which is based on uh, JSON REST. These are modern identity standards, which are supported by uh, major development toolkits and often work out of the box with uh, off-the-shelf uh, software. Every message sent in the system uh, can be encrypted at the message level as well as the transport level, uh, which will makes a change from using a shared secret system to a public key encryption system. So the people aren't in exchanging uh, secrets uh, over the network. The most important part is that it meets the M72 requirements, which is a re requirement of Traficom, the, the former Viesten de Vierasto. Uh, for, for data processing. The specifications which have now been built um, are compatible with, uh, with EIDAS legislation, so the same terminology, same, uh, same uh, attribute names are used. And uh, Technically, the broker will adopt a much larger role in the process if the broker is used. So for developers, the considerations you have to think about now if you're using a service or you want to add strong authentication to your service is to have a look at the market and to compare the existing brokers and select one. You can compare them based on price, based on brand, based on services, based on the promise of service level agreements that they give to you. You'll get test connection information from that, from that broker and you'll be able to use an existing library to connect your application uh, to the, to the network. We strongly suggest that you don't try to implement these identity standards yourself. Identity is very hard and it's very easy to make mistakes. 
use a tried and tested framework, uh, typically provided uh, as part of your development environment. It can be sometimes challenging to test, to use automated tested, testing for, for these, uh, these workflows when you're testing against an external service, and you may need to set up your own internal test services. And you may want to also consider failover options. If the broker goes down, then your users won't be able to log in, or they won't be able to reset their password. So you may want to consider two commercial agreements with, with two brokers, so that if the first broker goes down, you can switch to the second one while the first one fixes themselves. Um, and don't forget that authentication is only the first step in the user journey, and that once the user has signed in, they typically need a user account, they typically want to have a dashboard where they can see information about their account. They want to be able to initiate their subject data access rights, such as downloading their data or deleting their account. And they want to delegate access to a third parties, such as their partner, their children, or, or lawyers, or, or other companies. And OB Secure provides tools for enabling also that registration workflows, invitation workflows, and, and user management. And the time is now. We really have to start on this because from 1st of October, uh, the old system will no longer be, be working. Information, more information about uh, Lotomus Verkosto or Finnish Trust Network can be found from the um, National Cybersecurity Center website. They have a list of the approved, currently approved, uh, service providers within the network. The grey ones are working as brokers, and the blue ones. Uh, are, are um, providing identity. This was updated uh, yesterday. And we're having a workshop immediately after this, uh, this talk where we're going to allow uh, you to connect your own application or connect our application to the Telia broker service. And we'll go through the process flow of how the actual message exchange works, how you set up an application to do that using OpenID Connect. We're going to look at the security considerations of connecting an app to the Finnish Trust Network, and um, also look at how to use a local user account to that. So I welcome you to the, the workshop room here, here next door after the speech, if this interests you. To wrap up, um, I said at the beginning that Finland is a world-leading digital society, and it's a world-leading digital society because it's powered by these strong identity APIs. And that has been the secret to, to Finnish success. So I want to thank you for your attention, and I welcome uh, any questions if there's time.